Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today for the Western Hummingbird Partnership, uh, Western Hummingbird Partnership um, webinar on pollinators, pesticides and disease. I'm Susan Bonfield, I'm the Director of Environment for the Americas. And of course, with the first messages, we'll just ask everyone to mute, mute themselves so that we can't hear your, uh, any discussion in the background. Um, and if not, maybe Daniela, you could mute them as well. I have a particularly bad internet situation today. So I have backup support. Um, Daniela Garcia from Environment for the Americas will take oh, over if one if I get off. And again, if you could mute yourselves, if you are not muted as you come into the room, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna start with just a brief description of what is the Western Hummingbird Partnership uh, to share a little bit about the kinds of work that we're doing. Um, the Western Hummingbird Partnership was created uh, primarily with the support of U.S. Forest Service international programs, and the goals are to develop a network to support hummingbird conservation. Uh, we like to support programs that are in research and education programs that help that benefit hummingbirds and their conservation as well. Um, and then we're looking at filling those gaps in our knowledge about what is impacting hummingbirds and what, it, what factors are threatening their survival and then supporting any strategies uh, that help us to accomplish our goals. Uh, we have a committee that is comprised of these or, uh, representatives from these organizations. So there are representation, representatives from Canada, the United States and Mexico. Uh, we do focus on Western migratory hummingbirds and these are the places where they migrate to nest and winter. And Environment for the Americas, we're a nonprofit organization. If you're familiar with us, you probably know us for our coordination of World Migratory Bird Day, or maybe you know us for some of our internship programs. Um, we also do a lot of international work and because of our experience working across borders, uh, we, were, um, we were asked to help to facilitate the Western Hummingbird Partnership. So we do some of, a lot of the logistics of scheduling meetings and organizing webinars and other projects like this. Uh, we also conduct research as well. And again, we do a lot of uh, outreach and education. But talking about hummingbirds and what are some of the challenges that we have, as you all know, that they're very difficult to study. Um, they're hard to capture on point count surveys. They're difficult to ban because it requires special training and specialized uh, equipment. Um, but we are learning a lot of information about them. And what we do know is that some species are definitely in decline. And so what we wanna do is, again, to be able to capture the information that can help us to fill the information gaps and uh, help to protect them. Um, uh, the birds of conservation concern that are listed by the US Fish and Wildlife Service include Calliope hummingbird, Rufus hummingbird, Allens, Broadtailed, and Costas hummingbird. And we're, we're learning more and more, and, and some new papers have come out recently that have been really helpful. Some of these show, for example, the impacts of climate change on overwintering habitat and how those habitats are gonna be seriously restricted in the future. Um, we've also looked at changes in phenophase and how that might affect arrival times and contribute to mismatch and timing between hummingbirds and their nectar resources and also looking at the impacts of fire or the use of fire for hummingbird conservation. Um, we've had projects in Los Angeles, California, as well as um, in Mexico now, currently with Sarayi Contreras. Um, one of our speakers today will talk about the impacts of agriculture and some of the chemicals that we use for agricultural fields. And then another of our speakers today will talk about some of the diseases and other impacts that threaten hummingbird populations. So we have a very full uh, presentation for you today. Um, please be aware that we also provide a number of resources, including um, habitat and, and uh, planting guides, as well as education materials, and our most recent uh, Rufus Hummingbird State of the Science and Conservation. And you can find those on our website at Western Hummingbird Partnership uh, online, or you can ask us for hard copies of some of these materials. Um, we do support research. So again, some of that research on fire and also banding um, research. Uh, we also are working to provide trainings like this one. Uh, so one of the things that we hope to do in addition to providing webinars, which we began last spring, um, as you can see here, uh, is that we, we work to bring stakeholders together. So we'll be hosting a hummingbird banding, banding training in 
April of 2022 in Los Angeles, California. So if you're interested in that, uh, we hope you'll get in touch with us. Um, thanks to our committee members for all their support for the Western Hummingbird Partnership. They participate in a lot of meetings that help us move forward with our agenda. And so that's a lot of work uh, and it's all voluntary. And for more information, you can reach out to me. Um, you can check our Facebook page, you can go to our website, uh, but please uh, keep in touch. We like to include as many people as possible in the work that we do. As I mentioned before, I'm having some difficulties with my internet today. So we have a team of people who are here to help with that. Uh, but in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll ask each speaker to go in the order of their presentations, which they have, um, and to introduce themselves so that in case I get knocked off, they'll be able to introduce themselves and move forward. Each speaker has 20 minutes and then five minutes for questions from you. And we look forward to all of this information. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker who is Christine Bishop. Um, Greg Butcher will be joining us a little bit later. So thank you, Christine, for joining us today. We look forward to your presentation. And you are up. Thanks very much. And um, can you see my screen? Yes, you are up. Okay, good. Um, just okay. I'd like to introduce myself. As, as Susan mentioned, I'm I'm part of the Western Hummingbird Partnership. I'm a research scientist uh, working for the last 32 years with Environment and Climate Change Canada, which is the Department, Federal Department of Environment in Canada. I'm also an adjunct professor at Simon Fraser University and University of British Columbia and Thompson Rivers University. Uh, so I work in a lot of different places around our um, province. I'm located here in British Columbia. And the first uh, picture that you're seeing here is of a hummingbird taking a pee. And uh, you may see this um, quite often actually at your feeders and it might just look like pee to you, but to an ecotoxicologist like me, that is liquid gold. And the sorts of things that are uh, coming out of there are both urine and, uh, or at least we call it cloacal fluid. And we also um, can see uh, sometimes fecal pellets. So you can see how tiny they are. And this is here, just the, the tip of somebody's finger. And this is a hummingbird that's uh, wrapped so that we, when we handle the birds when we're doing research, we don't have to put our fingers on their feathers um, and also allows us access to their um, legs so that we can band them. But also when we're handling them, they just naturally occasionally pee and we're able to collect this. Uh, pee for pesticide analysis, um, but we're not the only ones that get information out of um, fecal pellets and urine. For example, uh, one of our colleagues, um, Alison Moran, Rocky Point Bird Observatory, um, collected fecal pellets from the edges of hummingbird nests and also on the vegetation around them, and were able to use DNA barcoding to identify the insects that are actually uh, consumed by these birds. So that's a non-invasive way to actually collect more information about what these birds actually eat. And by the way, it's mostly uh, small soft-bodied flies. Oops. And in California, um, Hazelhurst et al in 2021, this paper is just recently published with a um, the title that's sort of a mouthful, but really uh, what it means is that they also use fecal pellets to analyze using this DNA barcoding method, um, analyze these things to find out what flowers hummingbirds were using. And um, the interesting thing about that is that they're using many flowers, not just red tubular flowers, but any flower with nectar. And they're also using a lot of flowering trees. So keep that in mind um, when you're thinking about 
planting from pollinators. Also, um, Sarah Hebert um, utilized urine from hummingbirds to look at corticosterone, which is a stress hormone. Um, so there's a lot of information in pee and poop. And the kind of research that uh, we've been doing here in British Columbia has involved looking at both um, the urine and the fecal pellets. And in this case, the data you're seeing is from the urine that we collected from Anna's hummingbirds here and also Rufus hummingbirds. And we're interested not only in um, hummingbirds, but also we've done um, complementary studies on honeybees and uh, honey and nectar. But um, what we're interested in here is the insecticide use around blueberry fields, because it's a, a very intensive cash crop here in the Fraser Valley. And we see the Fraser Valley um, here, which is um, sort of Vancouver up to the coastal mountains, as a bit of a microcosm for a lot of agricultural areas around the world where there's a lot of um, uh, agriculture done in uh, bottom valley lands. So you'll see the compounds that are named here, thiamethoxin, imatocloprid, clothianidin, and these are part of the a group of chemicals known as the neonicotinoids, which I'll explain a little bit more about later. Um, but we're interested in them because CAN is in the process of regulating them and monitoring their levels in um, parts of Canada. So something to keep in mind as I talk about insecticides are these benzene rings that you'll see um, here. I'm pointing them out with my mouse pointer. I hope you can see it. But these benzene rings indicate that um, compounds can be relatively persistent. Um, they're the same kind of rings that occur in things like dioxins and polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, these compounds aren't as persistent as those, but those are the things that can keep um, chemicals like this around the environment. I also wanted to talk about what we learn about uh, pesticides from the poop because there's compounds that tend to bind more in watery substances like urine. And then there's those that combine more with um, things like fecal pellets. And this is an example of a compound, piperonal butoxide. And again, you see that benzene ring. And it's not actually a pesticide, but it's a compound that's mixed with pesticides to make them more toxic to ideally to just the, the pest insect. Um, but they all are present um, to inhibit liver enzymes and they can be active in other species. So this is the area that we're working in um, here in the Fraser Valley. I have a larger map in, the, in a second here, but um, just to give you a sense that this is the Fraser Valley agricultural area, and it's also being detected in our reference areas. So not just in the agricultural areas. Um, and one of the reasons for this is that this compound um, is in a lot of synthetic pyrethroids that are used domestically, like around people's houses, it's considered a more environmentally friendly pesticide. So, um, but on the other hand, um, the compounds that we're finding in um, the neonicotinoid group, they're primarily higher in um, areas that are agricultural. So this just gives you a, a zoom picture of uh, where our study sites are. And again, here's Washington State, you know, Oregon, um, British Columbia and Alberta. We're working down in this area. The map that's blown up here shows you um, Vancouver's in this area. And this agricultural valley extends up into this area. And then we have comparison sites over here in more remote areas on Vancouver Island here at Port Alberni and near Victoria. So as I mentioned, we're interested in um, agriculture and um, particularly in this case, blueberry fields representative of general um, berry production or it could be orchard production because neonicotinoids are used on almost every crop including um, cereal crops and as well as in greenhouses these days. So, uh, and you can see that even though this is a relatively rural sort of pastoral area, um, you have your blueberry field here and we capture the birds by um, having hummingbird feeders out and then we have a trap over them and we just have a fishing line and as the bird comes in to feed 
um, we drop those drapes and then we can reach in and um, take the bird out for sampling. We handle the bird for approximately two minutes and then they're released. So the interesting part of this uh, for beyond the hummingbirds is just that we also know that sites like this, and this is one of our main study sites, um, that the pesticides are present in the flowers of the blueberry fields, but also they're drifting off the field because the way that they're applied is a tractor pulling an air blast sprayer behind it. Um, and it's occurring in wildflowers in the field next door, as well as even the flowers around this home. We also know that the, the honeybees um, are also picking up these compounds. So the compounds that I mentioned earlier were um, these three um, and, and, and another type of um, neonicotinoid acidium mitprib we also measure. But in this study, um, we also identified that there's a new type of systemic compound um, that's related to these compounds, but it's just being introduced. And this is the first time that had been detected in any wildlife um, in a paper that we published recently. So there's new compounds coming on the market all the time. Now this compound, Fluperidifuron, is uh, less toxic to bees, at least acutely in terms of um, short-term exposure. We don't know about the long-term effects. Um, so there's not that many papers or research studies that have been done on them yet in the field. It's not in, just in Canada as an issue. Um, in 2019, um, Emily Graves and I'm one of their speakers today, Lisa Tell, published this paper where collections of um, black tin hummingbirds and also anilus hummingbirds, these are birds that were found dead, um, were collected throughout um, parts of California. And they found that pesticides are pre present not only inside the bird, that's in their urine and in their um, fecal pellets, but also um, on the outside of the bird. Um, so they took the, uh, the dead bird and they rinsed them to determine what would be on their feathers. And this is um, a completely new kind of um, sense of where hummingbirds could be picking up the pesticides, not just from their food, but they could be exposed through pesticide drift and actually preening and then being exposed that way. The other aspect of this work was that they looked at um, a wider variety of chemicals than we had examined, uh, carbamate, organophosphates as well. And um, I'll explain to you in a minute um, about a little bit more about those types of chemicals, which are still currently in use. But back to the neonicotinoids, um, which are in the news quite a bit these days. Let's start from the bottom um, here. This is a, these are compounds that have been reported on over the last um, 20 to 30 years that have indicated that they do have effects on birds in terms of their body condition, organ function, immunity, hormone regulation, behavior, et cetera, breeding investment. A number of papers have come out. More recently, um, it's been identified that in wild birds here, um, imidacloprid can reduce appetites, suppress the body mass, and can delay migration in seed-eating songbirds that eat these compounds, even if they just eat two or three seeds that are treated with the compounds. And one of the main study species here is a white-crowned sparrow. And what they did was they actually um, dosed some of these birds, released them with tags, and looked at how long they stayed around um, in their migration stopovers. And moved on. Um, similarly, um, there's a number of studies that have actually shown where um, birds in the wild have eaten, eaten treated seeds and um, can actually kill birds. And more recently, some of the work that we've done is taken the field studies that we did, determine what concentrations the birds are being exposed to, and then we tested them in the lab with the ruby-throated hummingbird, which is um, relatively common compared to some of those in the West. And we found that um, even with three days exposure, it can suppress respiration of these birds. And what's important here is that we know uh, from our field studies that these birds are being exposed for months at a time. Uh, so it's not just a, a three day exposure. 
I also wanted to point out that insecticide use is also an issue for um, survival of uh, other types of food for the birds. They're not just eating nectar. Hummingbirds feed on insects. And we also know from um, related research that aquatic insects actually have um, some really important fatty acids that provide even more um, high quality food than terrestrial insects. And so when you have pesticides that are trickling off into aquatic ecosystems, this is even more of a problem. And hummingbirds um, eat insects as many others do, but uh, neonics can also affect soil invertebrates. And um, so this food removal issue for our insecticide, or um, food removal um, of insects can be a problem um, just in terms of survival, whether or not the birds are actually being directly affected. So I mentioned a bunch of different types of pesticides and the numbers are sort of, the names are sort of swirling around, I'm sure. And I just wanted to give you a bit of a timeline on um, the pesticide, or at least the uh, chemical pesticide era that um, we ventured into in the last century. So <clears throat> prior to 1949, um, there were pesticides being used to control especially um, fungus in um, different types of uh, crops, lead, arsenic, sulfur, they're common. In fact, lead and arsenic still persist in some places in some agricultural areas. Um, but those are largely uh, dropped um, in 1949 when DDT was um, actually accidentally discovered. Um, and it was realized that this could be uh, what we call a contact insecticide. So if you spray it on an insect, they'll drop dead. Um, so DDT was discovered in 1949. In fact, the person who discovered it um, received a Nobel Prize for it because this really revolutionized dealing with insects, not only in agriculture, but also in public health, like things like lice. But uh, then DDT and related compounds were introduced, um, many of them as um, very, uh, persistent for many decades. And then it was identified that there's some species of birds are highly sensitive and it's caused eggshell thinning. Um, this wasn't necessarily the reason that these compounds are taken off the market. In fact, um, one of the main reasons was that some low levels, or sorry, some very high levels can actually cause um, cancer in humans. But this, there certainly was public outcry about this eggshell thinning problem. So those compounds were largely banned in the 1980s. Then the organophosphates were introduced. Um, these ones are highly neurotoxic to all types of vertebrates um, and as well as invertebrates, which is what they're designed to kill. Um, whereas DDT and related compounds were not acutely neurotoxic. The organophosphates were not persistent. Um, they would be generally in the environment for weeks as opposed to decades. And then another type of compound, which I mentioned earlier, the pyrethroids, um, not very persistent, low neurotoxicity, um, but actually not as effective at killing insects. Um, of course, when you're using these compounds all the time, insects start to get resistant. So there's the other issue of combining these compounds, utilizing them for decades, and then resistance developing. There was huge concerns about human health because a lot of times uh, people were being uh, poisoned by um, applying these compounds. So the neonicotinoids were developed and uh, they have very low mammalian toxicity. So great, they don't have, um, they're neurotoxic, but the, the, um, their persistence is relatively low, um, but they are a very different type of chemical. They're systemic. They can move all through the plants, whereas these other compounds tended to not to move into plants. And they had relatively low acute toxicity uh, to mammals, and it appeared in the case uh, for birds as well. So in the 2000s, it became uh, more aware uh, in the research realm and also in the regulatory realm that these compounds could be toxic to birds, bees, um, and the European Union actually banned the three major compounds that I mentioned earlier, but the USA and Canada still hasn't had any bans, so they've 
Canada has had some regulation on these compounds. And more recently, the, the neonicotinoids, the three major ones are being used less, but new systemics are being introduced as I mentioned earlier. So as I mentioned, the contact insecticides are the ones that you might be familiar with, and this is how they work. Spray, hopefully they kill the pests, but some of them are very persistent. And I said that neonicotinoids are systemic and they actually are commonly applied as what they call seed treatment. So these blue and um, blue and red uh, seeds here are actually um, cereal seeds for soybean or corn um, or wheat, and they're treated with the chemical. So it's stuck onto the seed. And as the seed grows, this compound moves into the plant so that anything that bites that plant is going to be exposed to a pesticide. Um, when I say they're most commonly applied as seed treatments, when you're talking about the Midwest area of um, North America, the amount that's applied is huge, but um, they're also applied as sprays that I mentioned in um, orchard and berry producing areas. So they're relatively, um, low persistence, but they're still present um, over a couple of years. And to give you a sense of how hummingbirds fit into this picture is that you have this compound, some birds actually consume the treated seeds when they're on the landscape. Um, but as these chemicals persist in the soil, they can flow off into water, they can move into the, the plant and be present in nectar, sap, soil, insects. So how many birds actually are feeding potentially on the nectar from the plants? They're also potentially eating contaminated insects. And um, these compounds are also used in forestry. So um, the birds can actually pick them up as they eat um, sap that, from sap sucker wells. And finally, I just wanted to leave you with the fact that these compounds are being detected in many types of birds, not just seed eating birds, of course, we're talking about hummingbirds today, but even raptors that we would normally associate with eating small mammals. And also, um, finally, I'd just like to say that here's a compound that are on the landscape and birds have to contend with a lot of different stresses, uh, many of which we're gonna talk about today. And pesticides are just one of many, um, but these are the compounds that um, will be used in the future and um, we need to understand their uh, full implications. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat box for Christine or you're welcome to raise your hand and ask it live. Any questions? Super great talk. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Christine is um, doing some amazing work. Uh, it's just really good to know that people are working on this topic. Um, Christine, how, how much, I'll just ask a question. How much work is going on looking at, you know, hummingbirds are so, so challenging. How much work is going on looking at pesticides and their impacts on hummingbirds? Um, <clears throat> well, I think that the work that we did um, has, has triggered other people to get interested in this issue. Um, I, I just have to say that, you know, the paper that we published um, starting with the work that we did in 2015 was actually the first time that anyone had actually considered hummingbirds as being exposed to pesticides um, and showing that it could actually happen. So it's had an impact in terms of um, regulators starting to incorporate this into their risk assessment models. Um, at the same time, you know, Emily Graves and Lisa Tell um, were, you know, looking at just, you know, hummingbirds and um, those that you find, you know, window kills, et cetera. Actually, um, the question that still remains is, um, is it possible that birds that are found dead um, have been exposed to pesticides and it's affected their behavior and maybe even um, caused them to be disoriented and fly into windows? So, um, there's that work that's going on. And um, <clears throat> there's related to this, there's some interesting work that's being done in British Columbia 
uh, on uh, the impacts of other types of pesticides like glyphosate, which is used as a herbicide. And it's used in forestry throughout huge parts of the world, um, but especially in North America to suppress the growth of deciduous uh, plants so that it can cause what they call conifer release or give um, conifers a uh, selective advantage. And um, so this is a compound that's been used extensively and there's research coming out now that's just published here in um, uh, 2020 and 2021 showing that this compound can persist and it actually can cause uh, problems for reproduction in flowers um, in uh, some of these forested areas. And this is a real concern because the idea was that this compound was sprayed um, and then you know, walk away, it's gonna break down and eventually flowers will reemerge, but, and which is really important for hummingbirds. But uh, in reality, um, it's coming out now that um, this compound persists and it actually can cause some problems for reproduction for those flowers. So um, pesticides um, can be pretty insidious in terms of the entire ecosystem that hummingbirds are attempting to um, survive in. Uh, so, you know, these are sort of related things. Um, and I have to say right now, I, I don't know of any um, more recent papers on hummingbirds other than that what we're doing, but I think um, some of the work that's come out now has probably spurred others to start to look at uh, pesticide exposure in other parts of um, North America. Well, that's good to know, and you're definitely a leader in this field, so we appreciate your focus on this. You do have a lot of questions coming in now, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take one more question. And then I'm going to turn it over to, we're going to do a little switcheroo on the schedule because of some people's uh, timing for today. And so we're going to let Lisa Tell go next, followed by Stacy uh, for the presentations. But while Lisa's getting ready, um, Christine, could you answer this question came from Laura Latour. Can you explain again how you identify the plant species the hummingbirds feed on using their pea? Okay. Um well, they use uh, that, that study, the two studies that were done that I mentioned, um, they actually looked at the fecal pellets. And the first one by Alice Moran, um, they found hummingbird nests. This is Rufus hummingbirds. And they looked at the uh, fecal pellets, <clears throat> primarily ones actually in on the um, plants around the, uh, around the nest because the birds, you know, they, they poop and they actually eject the <laughs> fecal pellets onto um, the plants around them. And they're pretty easy to identify once you know what you're looking for. Um, so they collected those and they're able to do what they call DNA barcoding. So if you can imagine a barcode on a, on a product that you might buy, um, that's essentially what um, you could send these to a lab and um, have the, the fecal pellets analyzed to find out all the different types of, in her case, it was insects that they were looking for. But then um, Jenny Hazelhurst and uh, colleagues uh, had a different approach. Um, and what they did was they um, were banding hummingbirds. And so they would have the hummingbird banded, they get all the information on the individual bird, and then they would hold the bird in a cage for up to 20 or up to 10 minutes, and they'd have uh, filter papers on the bottom of the cage. And so when the hummingbird was there, <clears throat> when the hummingbird pooped, it would go on the filter paper. So they knew exactly what species, um, sex, age, you know, body condition, et cetera, um, of that bird. And then they could analyze uh, the poop that the bird produced. So they could just take that filter paper um, and have it analyzed for DNA. Um, and um, it was, I mean, a little bit more invasive, but um, the birds are fine. They didn't have any um, impacts um, on the birds that were released and um, they could track their uh, survival with uh, bands if they wanted to. And this is a really um, great method uh, to look at all the different um, plants that are in the general area. Um, and it's a huge number of plants the hummingbirds are using, and as I mentioned, even with uh, utilizing flowering trees, which is not uncommon, but I don't think people are as aware 
how important flowering trees are for hummingbirds and um, the nectar that they produce. Thanks so much. So you, you do have a lot of questions in the box, but um, for everyone, we'll take more questions at the end of the entire session. So if you wanna hold that thought and come back to it, then we'll see how many we can get answered for you. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Lisa Tell. Lisa. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today. And um, thank you, Susan, very much for organizing this event. Um, my name is Lisa Tell, and I'm a professor at the School of Veterinary Medicine here at UC Davis. And I'm the director for the Hummingbird Health and Conservation Program. So today I'm going to talk a bit about some work that we've been doing evaluating um, health and hummingbirds. And um, let me go ahead and start here. Um, so we've been trying to do an assessment of um, looking at kind of normals for hummingbirds in addition to how to monitor their health long-term um, given the declines that we're seeing in populations as Susan had mentioned earlier. So one of the questions is um, why is it important to go ahead and um, study hummingbird health. Um, so one of the reasons why we were really interested in doing this is because we think that, as um, Christine was mentioning, um, if you look at what's happening in our environment, we think that hummingbirds are a great sentinel species for looking at environmental health in general. And given that we have these species that are threatened, endangered, or special concern, we know that we need to know what's going on in general with them in regards to what diseases okay, really cool. I stick this in here. Um, are potentially threatening them and um, what we can do to help minimize those um, threats. So at this time, little is really known about normal health parameters or what diseases are impacting hummingbirds. And so that's why we start our efforts. So when you, know, you have to um, study these animals and when you have to do research on them, it's really a challenge because um, the work that Christine's group was doing on live hummingbirds was awesome because she was able to get those urine samples and some of the other work that she's been mentioning that's been being done on urine samples and fecal samples. But in general for health, there's some other types of samples that we need to get, which is challenging. And it's especially challenging because they're such small animals and you have this specialized handling and sampling and especially laboratory analysis. A lot of the laboratory methods that have been designed for other species where you might be able to do some studies um, are developed for things like maybe dogs or cats or maybe a cow or something like that. And so what you have to do is you have to take that method and you have to design it for a sample that's really, really, really small. Um, so that's definitely a challenge. So one of the things that we do, as Christine was mentioning, is um, we have a banding program and that allows us when we want to do studies <coughs> or we want to look long term at maybe a disease that's impacting a bird, um, we ban them so we can uniquely identify that animal. Um, we go ahead and identify the age, sex, and species, and that also allows us to know what diseases might be affecting what age groups or males versus females or even um, individual species or cross-migrating across species. So this banding allows us to um, look at um, presence or absence so that we know what birds are being exposed to. It also allows us to <coughs> <laughs> excuse me, perform longitudinal studies on individual birds so we can track animals over time. And it also gives us some longevity data. So another thing that we're doing is we have a tagging program um, that we're using. There are passive integrated transponders. They're these little microchips. They're like the microchips you put in a dog or a cat. And we're using those to track hummingbirds too. It allows us to identify individual birds, but it also allows us to know, <coughs> excuse me, the presence or absence of those birds um, without having to have someone capture them, um, look at their band and identify 
um, that individual bird, <laughs> excuse me, when um, a human is actually doing the trapping and the capturing. So what happens is there's an antenna that is here. This is live. Um, so birds are coming in. The antenna detects that tag and the bird comes in and the tag is read. And then we're able to know no matter what day it is, no matter what time of the day it is, that that bird has been present at the feeder. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to actually look at interactions between birds. And so birds that come in contact with each other, we're able to identify. So these large circles are birds that are coming in contact with um, for a long period of time and with a large number of birds here. And these are females also with the larger circles that tells us that they were in contact with um, a large number of birds for a long period of time. And then you have like other birds like this that um, has limited contact with birds for lesser period of time. And this allows us to really look at, especially for those diseases where contact or association <coughs> with other birds or feeding concurrently in feeders, um, it allows us to look at those interactions and um, can allow us to look at disease transmission. Okay, some other studies that we've done is we um, wanted to look at um, what diseases were affecting um, hummingbirds. And um, we did this in California. We looked over a span of a little over uh, 10 years at hummingbirds that died. We had a total of 61 hummingbirds that were either found dead or discovered in um, a state where they were essentially comatose and then they died shortly after that. The birds came from the San Diego Zoo or a rehabilitation center called the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. And so um, what we did was, this is kind of like what's done with humans with an autopsy, is we look at the tissues and we look to see what kind of um, diseases are affecting the birds and what they might have died from. So as you can see, a large percentage of the birds died from trauma or unknown. So 31.1% of the birds, we can identify the reason for death. But there were diseases that were, <coughs> excuse me, classified as infectious. So these would be things like bacterial diseases or viral diseases. The birds also had parasites. Um, some of the birds were really skinny. They had scant body condition. And then um, um, a number of birds had more than one process going on. So um, they had trauma infection or parasites um, or combination of things. So we saw that there was bacterial um, types of infections. These were the, bac um, the um, bacteria here or the birds had disseminated bacterial infections or bacterial infections in their lungs. Um, there were viral infections, there were fungal infections, aspergillosis is a common um, fungus that affects birds. Um, there were blood infections in, um, in their red blood cells, this is hemoproteus, and then there were parasites, and um, they have these huge tapeworms, and when you actually look at it on the slide, so you're looking at the tissue on the slide, the tapeworms are huge uh, compared to the, the hummingbird's gastrointestinal tract. So that was really dramatic. All right, another disease um, that we saw in that last infection that we're interested in studying is avian pox. It's a study that affects what we call the integument system. So that's your hair, your fingernails, your toenails. Um, and the most common thing that people see are these deformities on the beak. It's an understudied disease. Um, we know that hummingbirds are highly vulnerable to this disease, especially given their um, fast metabolic rate. Anything that compromises them could compromise their overall health. Um, and then there's the concern for potential transmission. So this disease is um, typically transmitted in other bird species by mosquitoes. We don't know exactly what's transmitting it in um, hummingbirds. There is the potential for airborne particles or if birds are fighting and there's an abrasion of the mucous membrane, <coughs> excuse me, or the skin, um, 
and it's contaminated with a pox virus, that's another way that it can be transmitted. Okay, so what we wanted to ask was what samples could be used to test for this pox virus. Um, and so what we did was we tested birds um, all in California at a variety of different sites. And the big thing that's important here is typically what you have to do to test this for this disease is you have to get a tissue sample. And the great thing about this was that we actually looked at feather samples from the tail and the body and also the toenail clips. And we were actually able to identify positive birds without actually having to take a tissue sample. And so that was huge. That's, that's a way that we can actually um, diagnose this disease in live birds without having to do a minor surgical procedure. Other studies that we've done is we've been looking at trace elements. So things like lead, cadmium, mercury. Um, we were, we've been looking at that in feather and tissue samples. Um, we've been looking at normal vitamin tissue concentrations in hummingbird samples. We've been looking at um, insecticides. And so um, Christine did a great job of covering this. What we did was we did this on dead hummingbirds and we developed a method that was very sensitive that allowed us to look at um, the presence of the neonicotinoids on the surface of the birds in addition to in their tissues. Um, so what we did was we rinsed their feathers and we took the carcasses and we ground them up. These are birds that had already died at rehabilitation centers. We looked for neonicotinoids in addition to some other pesticides. And the big thing that we found was that 68% uh, were positive for at least one target compound, but overall the concentrations were low. They were in trace concentrations. Okay, other studies that we've been doing, um, we're looking at those parasites, feather mites that are on the tail feathers of um, hummingbirds. So what we did was we used this cool tabletop scanning electron microscope and we could get images of all these mites. Okay, so this is what they look on light microscopy, but this is look, what they look like on um, transmission electron microscopy. And you can see all the mites here um, on the one feather of a bird. It's kind of disgusting looking. <laughs> We've also been looking at, for parasitology, the presence of blood parasites um, that are affecting birds. And then the last study I wanna talk about is we've been looking at the contamination of hummingbird feeders, the sugar water, and comparing that to floral nectar. So what we did was we looked at human provisioning, so providing feeders, and we discovered that um, it can actually um, shape what happens to um, wildlife in regards to what kind of bacteria are exchanged. So what we did was we had all these feeders and we experimentally manipulated them. We limited them to no bird exposure. For some of them, only insects could um, visit them. And then for some of them, um, hummingbirds, insects, and everything else could um, be exposed to the sugar water. And so what we found was that flowers and feeders had um, different bacteria and fungus. Flowers predominantly had this protobacteria, but the feeders had all kinds of different bacteria. Now, most of them are considered non-pathogenic, but we don't know long-term what this difference in exposure of all these different bacteria can do. So we know that human uh, provisioning, so providing the fe feeders does influence what is ingested by hummingbirds, but at this point in time, we don't know how that impacts their health. So um, that's it for my presentation today. Um, thank you very much for your time. And um, I hope um, that gives you an overview of what we've been doing, looking at hummingbird health in general. Thank you so much, Lisa. Your work is so amazing. Um, any questions for Lisa, please put them in the chat box or if you wanna raise your hand or, or go live, you're welcome to as well. Um, from Sari uh, in Mexico, we have the question, what are the chances that an infected hummingbird will then infect another hummingbird through the same nectar feeder? So that's a really good question. And that's one of the things that we're trying to assess. It really kind of depends on what the disease is, 
and um, what the bird's condition is. So if it's a disease that is predominantly transmitted by like an insect biting it, well, the one thing that the feeders could do is the feeders could actually cause the birds to congregate at, um, at um, times like crepuscular times, so dusk and dawn. And um, what could happen is you might have more mosquito activity at that time and it might bite more birds. But actually the transmission at the feeder, that really depends on the disease. So if it's a bacterial disease and there's a bunch of bacteria in the feeder, then that could be transmitted. If it's one bird that's infected with a disease, maybe a virus, and that virus could be infected just by simple ingestion, then that also could be transmitted. It really depends on the situation and the disease. Thanks, Lisa. You have another question uh, from Evan Mettler. In regards to the different bacteria on the feeders, what's the next step in the research process? What is the time frame on assessing health? So um, one of the things that we'd like to do is um, kind of look um, long term at those birds to look at their general health and look at what they're being exposed to in the feeders. So that would be the next process um, for evaluating kind of that long term exposure. Um, and that's probably the next step that makes the most sense. Okay. And from, oh, I don't know if I'll get the first name, name correct, Karin Hansen. Uh, does cleaning hummingbird feeders on a regular basis, say every three days, take care of the disease factor for the birds? How often should you clean the feeder? Any other suggestions and what to use to clean it? Sure. Okay, so we get this question a lot. And um, what I recommend for cleaning feeders is it really kind of depends on the time of the year. Um, you know, sometimes if you can, I actually recommend cleaning feeders every day. Um, and during the summer, sometimes you have to do it multiple times because you might get this big bacterial bloom and then you see that cloudiness. Um, you know, I actually don't use feeders anymore. I try to plant plants um, and also those flowering trees, like Christine said, actually in California, they use a lot of the flowering trees because for me, trying to keep up with the feeders is really hard. In general, what I recommend to people is, um, you know, change it as often as um, you would to make it so that you would drink it yourself. That's my recommendation. The other thing I recommend is selecting a feeder that's easy to clean. So a feeder that doesn't have a lot of parts, a feeder that you can take apart easily, a feeder where you're not gonna get black mold in some of those areas that are hard to clean. Um, and then in general, um, I would say, you know, one of the things you want to do is clean it in a method using a method that would be safe for human consumption. So <clears throat> those are typically um, my recommendations. Great advice. And um, we'll take another question. Jim Cunningham wants to know where are the transponders placed? Oh, so the transponders are placed under the skin over their back. And um, we have transponded probably about um, 1,200 birds now and not having had any problems with that. Great. Um, any other questions? I don't see any other questions, but again, we'll be also giving people the opportunity to ask more questions at the end of this webinar. Um, so thank you, Lisa, so much. You always are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> we really appreciate your work. Um, and I'm gonna bring up next uh, Stacy Clark. We did switch the schedule a little bit for those of you who have joined more recently. Um, so Stacy Clark will be next with a review of US Forest Service pesticide use and risk assessments. Um, so thanks very much, Stacy, for joining us today. Hi, uh, thanks everyone. Thank you very much for the invite to be on today. Um, wow, there's been some really great presentations uh, so far. So. Um, I'm going to share my screen then. Um, do screen. And so um, today, oops, hang on, sorry, go back. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm the Regional Invasive Plants and Pesticide Use Program Manager for the U.S. Forest Service Region 5. Um, so today what I wanted to do was touch just very 
broadly on some complicated processes and regulations that uh, we follow when it comes to pesticide use and protecting um, non-target uh, species. So um, I'm gonna touch broadly on uh, the pesticides that we use, um, how we assess risk based on that use. And I wanted to highlight for you some recent changes that the EPA made in the way that they evaluate um, pesticides, especially when it comes to listed species. And I also wanted to touch briefly on where some of the gaps um, in our knowledge are, especially when it comes to birds like hummingbirds and pollinators. So there are many federal laws that regulate us um, when it comes to pesticide use. Um, FIFRA is the primary one, but we also have the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act, and most recently, the Healthy Forest Restoration Act. We also have many of our own um, handbooks and manuals that touch on policies related to pesticide use. Um, I wanted to just highlight the main gist in all of these, which is that whenever the Forest Service is proposing pesticide use, um, all of our planning is to ensure that we are only using pesticides that are registered um, in legal ways and that we only do that after appropriate risk assessments and the very lengthy and complicated NEPA process, which I'll briefly touch on. Um, I also want to just say that um, as, as, a, as the Forest Service here in Region 5, um, we actually use less than one-tenth of one percent of the total pesticide use um, in the region. So, um, you know, the amount of pesticides that we do use um, in comparison is very low. So um, this is our pesticide management webpage, and I'm just going to switch, if you'll bear with me real quick, to the actual webpage live. Um, somebody shout out if you're not seeing this or if that's not coming through, okay. And uh, so this is our national pesticide management and coordination webpage. Um, the reason I wanted to show you guys this is that anybody can visit this webpage. Um, and I wanted to highlight here this paragraph that talks about um, our NEPA planning and, and why, as the Forest Service, we have to go through special risk assessments. So this was the result of a lawsuit in the early 80s. And the outcome of that lawsuit is that the courts found that the EPA uh, review and registration process for pesticides was not sufficient to assess risk um, the way that the Forest Service is responsible for on a project and a site specific level. And so the courts mandated that we have to conduct our own risk assessments that are um, site specific. And so the way we do this is that the Forest Service has a program that develops a worksheet that takes a bunch of the data that's available, not just what was included in the EPA registration process, but also other literature and other studies that are more current and we run them through a bunch of different models and we um, represent them in these worksheets and those are called SARA worksheets and I'll discuss those in a little bit. Um, also, if you go over here to the left-hand side, there is a pesticide use risk assessments and worksheets page. And um, this discusses the, uh, the <clears throat> way we develop our risk assessments in our worksheets, which I'm not going to really go into, but if you scroll down to the bottom, you can see here that we have conducted risk assessments um, for over about 30 different herbicides. Uh, we have risk assessments for several fungicides and insecticides and um, a bunch of other things as well. And if you go to the right-hand side, these PDFs, are the actual risk assessments themselves. They're massive 
tomes of information, um, good for doorstops, uh, several hundred pages. Um, but these worksheets make that information a lot more accessible. So um, basically, uh, when we have to do our NEPA, anytime we propose a project that has any kind of uh, management on Forest Service land, we have to go through a NEPA process. And the risk assessment that we do for pesticide use has to support our compliance with that NEPA. Um, it has to be site specific and project specific. So we have to take into account things like soils information, hydrology information, locations um, or known uh, occurrences of listed species or critical habitat, um, all those types of things. We also do assessments based on the chemicals themselves and the chemical properties. Um, and we have interdisciplinary teams that we put together, um, biologists, fisheries, depending on what's needed, and they conduct their own biological, disciplinary specific biological evaluations. Um, and those are very in-depth and data supported, and those all go into the project folder as well. Um, through those data, we combine all of that with our risk assessments in our worksheets to determine what the effects are likely to be on both target and non-target species. And those effects are outlined in the final NEPA um, document. So um, as I mentioned, the final NEPA document should document those effects. It'll also talk about why we're proposing pesticide use and what alternatives um, may be available to us. Um, it includes all the risk assessment and the worksheet that um, we developed, uh, including each chemical that we're proposing to use and any adjuvants or surfactants that we're proposing to use. Um, the assessment will also include the target species and um, any project design criteria, which is really just a fancy way to say mitigation measures or steps that we're going to take in the field to minimize um, <clears throat> adverse impacts to non-target or off-site, um, non-target species or off-site movement of that chemical. We also have what's called a PUP um, that refers to a pesticide use proposal. And that is where the nitty gritty details of the prescription are included, um, any mitigation measures that we're going to take um, and whatnot, and that gets reviewed by each forest pesticide use coordinator and approved by the forest supervisor. We develop pesticide safety and spill plans um, on site, and we make sure that anybody who's on site has proper uh, protection, is following proper safety protocols, and is certified in the proper techniques to apply those pesticides. And then um, lastly, all pesticide use on national forest land has to be reported in our database. Um, so I kind of, this, in a summary, um, whenever we're doing this analysis, we include uh, site info, soils, hydrology data, uh, known locations of listed species, that kind of thing. Um, we have our SARA worksheet maker, which um, makes those risk assessment sites specific for us. They include a driver, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but it models uh, soils data and precipitation data. Um, and then we have our own massive tomes of the risk assessments themselves by chemical and our interdisciplinary team who reviews and provides their own evaluations and recommendations. So our Forest Service specific risk assessments are called human paras or human health and ecological risk assessments. So these are separate from and um, slightly different than the, um, the EPA's biological evaluations or assessments that are included in any uh, review or registration process. Um, and all of that data gets fed into this worksheet program. Um, this worksheet then spits it all out into a couple different tabs and a bunch of diagrams, and it highlights areas where there is concern or what we call a hazard quotient. And this, is help, this helps us guide our decision-making. It also is a great tool to help us communicate amongst our team 
and to the public about where we may have potential health or environmental concerns um, and what steps we're taking to minimize or mitigate those. Um, the worksheets provide uh, hazard quotients for um, based on our project specific application rates. It provides hazard quotients to target and non-target species. And there's also several dozen specialized exposure scenarios that basically run the gamut of anything possible that could happen in the field. So um, kind of mentioned this before, this lawsuit is the reason why um, we do our own risk assessments and um, why we must evaluate that information on a project specific basis. So I'm going to use an example here of carbaryl because um, one, it is an insecticide uh, and it does have some negative impacts at, to, to beneficial pollinators. And it also happens to be one of our main tools for fighting invasive insects and managing um, invasive forest pests such as gold spotted oak borer. So um, it is one of the more commonly used uh, insecticides that we will use in Forest Service. Um, on the left-hand side is the front page of that HERA, and um, the HERA itself um, has a specialized worksheet program that includes all that information um, that we run for every project. And so this is an example of some of the tables and some of the output from that worksheet program uh, specific to our prescription for carbaryl on that gold spotted oak borer project. Um, you can see on the bottom that, um, so basically anything that comes up with a hazard quotient of greater than one is something that we want to take a look at. Um, and so you can see here for birds, what they analyzed um, is they, they lumped them into two groups, small bird and large bird. Um, and then there's a couple different, this scenario happens to be an acute accidental um, exposure scenario where um, these birds are eating contaminated fruit or eating contaminated vegetation or drinking contaminated water or eating insects that have just been exposed to this chemical or eating fish and so on that were in the water where the chemical was um, dumped in or drifted to or something like that. And um, so you can see on the graph that there are a few scenarios um, where these hazard quotients are approaching or exceed one. And so we would look at those scenarios and determine whether this is um, relevant to our project and, and if so, what mitigation measures we would take, um, or if it may be that we just decide we don't wanna use that chemical at that rate, or we just don't wanna use that chemical at all, if we have some real concerns. Um, and so all that information is evaluated um, by the interdisciplinary team and each um, biologist or whoever it may be, takes that information along with all the other information um, and literature that's available and they develop their own biological evaluation for that project. And you can see here on the left-hand side that this one that was done um, for the Gold Spotted Oak Borer project was over 30 pages long. And this is just one member of the team's evaluation. And at the bottom, they have about eight listed species of concern that they wanted to address based on our proposed use for this chemical. Um, so once we decide to go forward with the use of that chemical on that project, it's documented, as I mentioned, in the pesticide use proposal. Um, and you can also take a look at our policies and um, any of those pesticide use proposals online. And these outline uh, basically the project locations, um, the chemicals and formulations and the rates of application where they're going to be applied, and any mitigation measures or limitations that we're going to impose on that application for that project. So I'm going to switch a little bit to using this carbaryl example to talk about the recent revisions that the EPA made to their method of biological evaluation. Um, so back in March of 2020, 
uh, the EPA revised their methods for evaluating pesticide use on listed species. And um, moving forward from that, any registration review or a new review of a new chemical will follow those revised methods. So Carbril had come up for a registration review and they released their final biological evaluation for Carbril in March of this year. Uh, so with their biological evaluations, uh, what these are are effects determinations. And for Carbril, they looked at almost 2,000 listed species and almost 800 critical habitats that may be exposed to Carbril use. And the effects determinations include either um, no effect, not likely to adversely affect or likely to adversely affect. And so for Carbril, what they found was that um, almost 87% of the um, species and habitats that they assessed had likely to adversely affect uh, determinations. And out of those determinations, um, about 70-ish percent had moderate evidence. Um, so it's not a ton, but it's not nothing. And um, about 10% uh, of the strongest evidence, um, about the strongest evidence had was about 10% of those um, determinations. And then it was about 20% of those determinations had weak evidence. So this table is from the chapter two of the biological evaluation, and it shows you the count by taxon of the uh, effects determinations um, for these groups of species. And so um, just looking at the birds, uh, you can see here that there was about 107 um, bird species that were identified as, as may being affected. And then they further went on to evaluate those and found that for about 80% or 81 of those, um, it was carbaryl would be likely to adversely affect those species. Um, you can also see here that obviously for um, terrestrial invertebrates um, and aquatic invertebrates, carbaryl is going to be pretty damaging um, being an in systemic insecticide. But they also found that um, there were some growth and reproductive effects on some, some of the birds, especially the smaller birds. And they also found that there were growth and reproductive um, growth effects on aquatic and terrestrial vegetation as well, which is interesting for an insecticide. And so um, the habitat determinations um, looked at, uh, this is a table summarizing the effects on the habitat determinations. And so for birds, they identified about 31 habitats that may be affected by carbaryl usage. And out of those, they pretty much found that all of them are likely to be adversely affected. Um, and I just wanted to mention here that the reason for this is that you have to kind of be familiar with the chemical properties of, of the chemical that you're talking about and how it interacts with the environment. And so carbaryl, um, it tends to move offsite either through spray drift or through runoff. Um, when it degrades in the environment, it's usually degraded by either hydrolysis or phytolysis or soil microbial activity. Um, it has a moderate soil adsorption rate, which means that it's relatively mobile in the soil. Um, it doesn't get bound up very tightly like other chemicals, and it also isn't extremely mobile or prone to leaching. So it's, it's moderately mobile. Um, it does not bioaccumulate uh, in, in organisms. Um, and when it does degrade, it doesn't degrade into anything of toxicological concern. So what does this all mean um, for us and, and everyone uh, using this chemical? Um, so the EPA must consult again with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine and Fisheries uh, Service 
to discuss these results and discuss um, any possible potential impacts and any mitigation measure, measures that they want to impose on the use of that chemical. Um, we also consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service and our local wildlife um, uh, staff and partners whenever we have issues of concern like this. Um, we also, in the Forest Service, have established our own best management practices when it comes to um, the application of carbaryl. It includes, but not limited to, um, no applications within 24 hours of rain or when wind speeds are greater than five miles per hour. We also use booms and lifts to make sure that we're getting um, the spray as close as possible to the target to avoid that drift and runoff. Um, we cover uh, things like picnic tables or You're other so sources of, uh, other sources of potential contact um, with the chemical. We do not allow any uh, mixing of the formulation within 300 feet of any riparian areas or wetlands or water sources. We also uh, do not allow any re-entry into the area within uh, the first 12 hours after application. Um, yeah. We do Thank not do any okay. spring. Thank so you. Do you have any uh, questions? Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, we do not do any spraying within 100 feet of any riparian areas or um, water sources. And when we do spray, we spray parallel um, to any um, riparian areas that are, um, that are on site. Casey, so, I'm, um, I'm just gonna tell you that you have about one more minute. Oh, okay, okay, sounds good. So um, a couple things that kind of stick out in terms of these data gaps uh, that I really wanted to mention, especially is this idea of surrogate species or this small bird versus large bird issue. Um, and you can see down at the bottom that the smallest bird size uh, was a red winged blackbird, which is still bigger, significantly bigger than a hummingbird. And um, as the size of the birds get smaller, so does that LD50, which is the amount of chemical needed for a lethal dose. And so um, many have pointed out that there needs to be a lot more studies done um, specific to smaller passerine type birds because it could be that as the birds get a lot smaller, this chemical gets a lot more toxic. Um, also, there's issues of um, surfactants and co-formulants in these products that we are protected by proprietary law, so we don't know what they are. And um, recent studies in the UK have found that it is the surfactants included in these chemicals that are most damaging to honeybees. Uh, the surfactants stick to their, their little hairs and um, it basically impinges their ability to conduct gas exchange and to breathe. And when they were sprayed with just glyphosate, this didn't happen. So it's actually not the glyphosate, it's the surfactants involved. And so um, just kind of in summary, I think um, as the other two presenters have mentioned, there is a lot more information that we need, especially when it comes to teratogenic and reproductive effects on future generations of, of these species. Um, we need to make sure that lab studies are representing what's environmentally relevant for what these species are encountering in the field. Um, it would help if we knew what these co-formulants were. <laughs> and did some research on those. And also there's a lot of updating that needs to be done even within the Forest Service. Um, most of our heroes are over 30 years old, which is pretty old, or sorry, most of our heroes are over 10 years old. And so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Stacy. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to give you one question and then we'll hold some other comments until again, the end of the webinar when we'll hopefully have some extra time for questions. Uh, but your first question from um, Sabrina DeRusso is, uh, is that court decision that required specific and more detailed analysis of pesticide use as part of the NEPA process, does that apply to just Region 5 or to the Forest Service nationwide? Yes, that applies to the Forest Service nationwide. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over now to Chris Halsh. And he will be talking about the impacts of pesticides on butterflies and looking at um, milkweed and other topics. So Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you. 
All right. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to talk. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, and I uh, broadly study the impacts of different stressors in the Anthropocene on um, butterfly populations. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about some of our work in the Western US, um, looking at the impact of pesticides. Um, full disclosure, I am not a toxicologist. I definitely, and I spend most of my time monitoring butterflies in the mountains. Um, and I am more of a population ecologist, but we have been thinking about pesticides a lot recently. So I'm going to, um, so I'm going to share some of our current, our recent work and talk about some of mine, our labs and more other people's work. So let me, let's see, share my screen here. Where is, hmm, sorry about this. I'll just do it this way. Hmm. Okay, let's do share. And we'll go to my slides. Let's do it this way. Cool. Yeah, uh, is that good for people? Yes, that looks good. Great. Sorry about that. All right. So um, the decline of insects has been a much talked about topic in the past five to ten years. I'm here. I'm just showing a study by Dave Wagner, a review that looked at some of these um, studies, and there were a total of 73 that he found. I'm um, just to highlight that uh, these are from across the world. Um, here we see a study from Ohio that looked at butterflies over 20 years and saw um, steady declines. Um, let's see. Um, a, a another study from the tropics. Um, we see loss of entire genera of, of caterpillars over 25 years. Um, this is a particularly important study, as, as you can see from this map, we, we have a, just an overall lack of data from the most diverse regions of the world. Um, but just to highlight that it's not always as clear of a story as these past two. Uh, this is uh, data from the UK or where we see um, kind of no clear trend over time. But when you look across all of these studies, a pattern does emerge. And that's about a one to two uh, percent loss per year of insect abundance. Um, now that doesn't sound like a lot at first, um, at least to me it doesn't, but then one to 2% year after year and the most diverse organisms on earth um, can add up to be a huge loss of biodiversity very quickly. Um, and so the, the contributing factors, I'm just a broad list of many of the things we, sh we all think about, right? Our habitat loss, climate change, invasive species, urbanization. Um, and I'm gonna talk about today, pesticide exposure, and I'm gonna focus on the Western US, especially California. And you can't really think about the decline of insects uh, in the West and not immediately think of the monarch butterfly. Um, this is really the poster for butterfly declines in the West, um, and for good reason. I have a paper from 2019, um, Pelton et al. Um, looked at historical data um, from the overwintering sites and found at least um, in 2019, there was a 99% decline compared to historical numbers, um, a quite devastating loss of monarchs. Um, just a quick review of monarchs. So they have two, there's sort of two distinct areas um, where they overwinter. You have the coast of California in the West, and these, these, and these are the monarchs that will then overwinter as adults. Um, and then they will breed across the West on milkweeds as caterpillars. The Eastern populations uh, overwinter in Mexico, and then over successive generations will go all the way up to Canada and then come back. Um, so I'm gonna focus on these Western ones. And they overwinter on, in these groves and make these, mag, you know, these magnificent butterflies. But then as caterpillars, they're spread across the uh, landscape and they eat milkweed. Um, here I've shown showy milkweed and narrow leaf milkweed, um, two of the most common species of milkweed in the West. Um, and this is a plant that they are very good at eating, but is actually very bad for most other caterpillars. Um, it has a really impressive way of defending itself, um, but monarchs are capable of overcoming this. Um, so um, some of our work from a couple of years ago, we actually wanted to look at milkweeds, um, collect leaves from, um, from the landscape and get them analyzed for, to see what pesticides are actually contained in the leaves. What pesticides are monarchs encountering on the landscape during their migration? Um, so to do this, we went, uh, we focused on the North Central Valley um, and we collected leaves from milkweed plants um, at uh, a, a variety of habitat types. So we collected it at, on ag margins, um, in urban landscapes, in refuges, and also bought some from retail stores. 
Um, so just to give you an idea of what these look like, uh, this top photo is showing milkweed in an urban riparian corridor. Um, and this bottom figure or this bottom picture is showing milkweed in an ag margin. And so before I go to the next slide, I'm going to it's going to be a very complex figure. I don't expect anybody to like squint and try to figure out what's going on. We're going to return to it later in the talk. Um, but this was the main conclusion of the paper where we have um, on the y-axis the uh, the total or the compounds we detected. And then each, each column uh, is a site that we looked at. Um, and this is just to say that everywhere we looked, we found pesticides um, in varying concentrations, varying compounds, but we always found pesticides. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the scale, which is to say this is a log scale. So we found the the uh, concentrations we found varied by you know at least three orders of magnitude, which begs the question: What does that mean, right? Is one part per billion bad for a monarch, or is it so low that it just doesn't really matter? Um, so we turn to the literature of people who have done uh, done lab experiments. Um, so for this paper, we found four studies that at the time had looked at the impacts of pesticides on monarchs in the lab and tried to quantify you know, the, um, the LD50, which is the concentration where you, you get half of your uh, caterpillars die. Um, and so I've split here into neonics, which I know we've talked about a lot, which it, it really has, neonics have gotten the, a, a vast amount of attention over the last 20 years. Um, well, one, because they're very good at what they do, which is uh, killing insects. Um, they're also just used a lot, um, but there are also some other compounds that were studied as well that we detected. Um, so with this, I can return to our figure and point out that the legend here on the bottom, we see that if, it's, if there's a white dot, it means it was detected on average above an LD50 for a monarch. And if it's a black dot, it means we only found trace amounts. So first I wanna highlight the four neonics that we found. And we did find four neonics, and some of them in high concentrations, especially uh, clothianidin here at this one site, but they weren't really ubiquitous on the landscape, um, at least in the sampling time that we looked. And, um, but we did find these other two compounds, which are two of the five most heavily used compounds in California. They were everywhere that we looked. And um, this top compound, which I think the thing I really dislike the most about pesticides is they have the worst names to try to pronounce. So I'm not going to even make an attempt. Um, but the top compound here, we detected uh, above lethal concentrations at about half of our sites. Um, and when we look across everything, 58 of the 227 samples uh, that we collected uh, tested above an LD50 for a monarch. Um, but there's another way to look at this data too that I think is as important. Um, and it's uh, that monarchs are not just encountering one pesticide at a particular site. At this, at this ag site I've highlighted here, leaves had on average 20 different compounds in them. And even at a refuge site, uh, this refuge site had on average 14 compounds per leaf. Um, so the question is not just how, you know, uh, how does one compound impact a monarch larva that's feeding on milkweed? It's how does that monarch larva react when it's eating one, two, five, 10, 20 different compounds at once, even though some of them might be in very low concentrations. So what does this mean for monarchs? It means the larval stages are being exposed to lethal and sublethal concentrations of individual pesticides, but they're also being exposed to many different pesticides. Um, and not all pesticides are neonics. Um, and so we need more research into different pesticides, lethal, sublethal effects, but also interactions between pesticides. Um, but the monarchs are not the only butterflies that exist in the West. So there's a further question is, are they really a special and really de you know, devastating case, or are they just one of many butterflies that are in decline in the Western US? Um, so we have data on this. So a paper that, um, uh, that we did this year um, used the 4th of July butterfly count data, um, which is a monitoring scheme that is designed after the Christmas bird count data, where once a year, um, sometimes more, but usually on average once a year, sites are visited um, and, uh, and butterflies are counted. Um, and this has been done across 200 sites in the West. Some of them have been monitored over 40 years. And the first highlight finding is this figure that I've presented here, where the dotted line is zero. So if you're on top of the dotted line, it means you're not changing over time. 
If you're to the right of the dotted line, it means you're actually increasing over time. And if you're to the left of the dotted line, it means you're trending downward over time. And we see many species are trending downward, um, much more than are actually trending upward at these sites. So we see an overall decline of butterflies in the Western US. Um, but what is in decline is the next question. Um, and so we can look at this and uh, based on these data, uh, the monarch actually is 38th on the list of the steepest declines in the West. Um, and that's not to say that the monarchs uh, aren't in decline or it's not a big deal. It is to say that their decline we know is devastating. We have probably the best data of butterflies over time on the monarch. And there are potentially many other species that are experiencing similar levels of devastating declines. Um, so there's other ways though. So monitoring data is one tool that we have. We can also play with other ways to assess with um, to assess risk now and also risk in the future. Um, so there are a lot of things, you know, there's the data that I just um, showed here. We also have awesome tools like community science data from iNaturalist. Um, there are also traditional traits, um, characteristics of species that we know should make them more or less susceptible to extirpations over time, like range size, um, what you eat as a, as a caterpillar. Um, some of our work we're working on uh, now is actually integrating this information into a risk assessment um, for, for, uh, to predict which species are in danger in the future. Um, so we can make a metric like this, and this is a pie chart representing what I'm going to show. This is how it's currently broken out. Um, there are different ways we can, we can, uh, we can represent this. But when we, use, when we uh, use the data this way and build a ranking system, we can think about species that are really in danger. Um, and in this ranking, the monarch is actually 61 out of um, all of the species, which is probably an underestimate um, given some of these data, but which is just another way to say that um, taking, a, you know, taking into account different types of data, there are still many other species that are potentially at risk. Um, I just want to highlight a few of these, the first, second, and third. Um, the long term uh, for number two, Vanessa Annabella, which is the West Coast lady. Um, in the time series uh, data that I collect, which was started, started being collected in 1970s, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, this species used to be seen on 80 to 100% of surveys. Um, and now it's seen once or twice a year. Um, Euchloe austenides, the uh, large marble, I believe, um, is believed to be extirpated at multiple of the sites that we monitor. Um, but what's the role of pesticides? Which is kind of going to return to the theme of this talk. Um, and to consider this, I'm going to uh, talk a little about this paper uh, put out by my advisor, Matt Forrester, in 2016, um, which used data collected by his, advi his former PhD advisor, Art Shapiro, at UC Davis. Um, I do want to spend a moment talking about just the, um, the amazing data set that Art Shapiro has collected over his career. Um, he has monitored 10 different sites uh, across um, Northern California, and he's gone to these sites every other week for 40 years, um, in, in some cases 50 years, to uh, monitor butterflies at all of those time points. Um, and what I'm going to present here uses the four sites that are embedded in the, in, in the, in the Sacramento Valley. Um, and it's really the best record of butterflies we have in North America. It's, it's, it's potentially the best record of, in, of insects we have in, uh, in North America. Um, so looking at these data, for the first 20 years or so where art was monitoring, um, butterfly richness here is what's shown. So on the y-axis, we have the number of individual species seen in the year. On the x-axis, we have year. Um, it was about, it was stable for the first uh, 20 years. Um, and then in the mid 90s, uh, neonics in this case started to be introduced into the Central Valley. Um, and after that happened, we see huge declines in the number of species that are showing up at sites. Um, and just to see that relationship directly, here's the number of species plotted against uh, neonics. Um, and I suppose it's not surprising that once a new really effective class of pesticides starts being used, we see less butterflies, but I am always a little surprised when we see patterns, large patterns like this emerge in monitoring data. Um, it's, it's, it is really quite stark. Um, so I also wanna to return to this paper we put out this year that looked at the 4th of July data. And I do wanna confess that 
in this paper, we didn't look at pesticides because these sites are actually biased towards natural areas, uh, areas that are removed from the threats of pesticides and, and urbanization. These really, um, so then when we're looking at these natural areas and we still see declines, what's going on? And the biggest signal we found in this paper um, was the impact of climate change, um, which is to say um, the main highlight finding was that sites that are experiencing the greatest warming in the fall are the sites that are seeing the greatest declines in butterflies. Um, another paper using the similar data, actually the same data, but looking, at, looking across the entire country from this year, uh, published this year by Crossley et al., um, found that cooler and wetter sites are experiencing increases in butterflies over time, and warmer and drier sites are experiencing decreases in butterflies over time. Um, which is to say warmer and drier sites is a pretty good way to describe the American West. So I bring up climate change because climate change is a threat that's facing, uh, it's, you know, it is a ubiquitous threat. It's, face, it's, it's, it's facing every population on earth. Um, and so this has the, this, this could potentially have the, the impact of, you know, it's compounding butterflies that are already facing other threats like pesticides, other threats like uh, habitat loss. Um, so butterflies are, are experiencing declines in the West um, and they're facing multiple threats at once. Um, and, we, and we know little about the impacts of these threats on most butterflies compared to the monarchs. So say we know more about monarchs than we do most other butterflies. And we don't know that much about monarchs. We know less about monarchs than we do about say honeybees and other types of um, pollinators. So, so we really just need more research into the impacts of different stressors and how they can interact to threaten populations both now uh, and in the future. Um, so I know insect decline talks are always such a bummer, um, and I'm sorry for giving such a bummer of a talk, um, but I do want to return to these different threats and, and what can we do and really highlight the importance of thinking about pesticides is that just thinking about kind of these, these three, climate change is going to take international shifts in policy and behavior, and even if we do that, the, you know, the effects, it, it'll, it'll take decades or even centuries to see, you know, these, these things really be, get better. And habitat loss, you know, protection and restoration of land is expensive and takes a lot of, you know, it takes so much effort. And that's to say we, we should do these as well. But pesticide exposure, this is a threat that we can remove much more quickly. You know, if, if this, is a, this is a big factor in the, in, it seems to be a big factor uh, on, in the declines of insects in the West. And this is a threat that we can remove quickly. Um, so I think it's a, a very important thing to focus on and put our efforts into. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Matt Forrester and Art Shapiro for collecting all this amazing data. Jeffrey Glassberg, who has organized the Fourth of July Butterfly Counts and curates that data. Um, all the co-authors from our pesticide paper and the Xerces Society and Linda Reynolds for funding it. Um, and then also um, uh, Susan Bonville for you know, organizing this talk and uh, two people who heard very early and worse versions of this talk and had to suffer through it. So um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I can happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. That was just fantastic, um, really interesting. And you know, we're coming from, some of us are coming from the hummingbird world, some of us from the more general pollinator world. So I'm sure for some of us that was new information. I don't know about um, people who focus on on insects. We well, do have a question from Crystal Barnes from Yosemite National Park. Um, she, uh, she says, uh, Yosemite has been working on habitat restoration for milkweed and monarchs. She's not positive, but she thinks the areas where they have monarchs and milkweed are less susceptible to pesticide loads. But would it be useful to study the compound loads in the butterflies occupying this area as a comparison? Um. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah, so is, the question is, should we, um, is, it, like, is, it, is, is it useful to look at like pesticide loads in regions like that? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, I mean, one, there's really, I guess it's like, it's work, but like, there's, there's, it's always good to learn. One, we can always be surprised, right? You might not expect things there. You can always be surprised. Um, and also, yeah, I think it's good to collect information on things like that and where, and um yeah, and it's just to have more data filling in the picture of what butterflies are experiencing is always, I think, always good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that database of Art Shapiro's is phenomenal. It really is. <laughs> yeah. 
And is that being continued today or not? It is. Art is collecting data in Sacramento still. And my work starting in 2018 is he also monitors mountain sites, which is my, the focus of my work. And so I have been collecting data uh, his, at, at his mountain sites. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that data set has really informed so much of what we know about the impacts of these major threats on butterflies in the Western US mm -hmm. in general. It's, it's, been, it's been a game changer. Yeah, that is a game changer. Um, and do you have a, I'm sure people would be interested in any publications. If you have a publication list, uh, we could share that as well. Yeah, um, I have my website. It feels so egotistical, I'm sorry, but it is the best spot. I have my publication. There's publications there. Also, our lab website has our publications. And I'd be happy to link what I referenced in the talk in the chat um, if people are interested. Great. And we'll also make that available. This, uh, this webinar will also be available as a recording and we'll put it on the Western Hummingbird website. Uh, so you will be able to provide you with more information. Um, Brandon wants to know if you have any sense of source versus sink populations for butterflies. Um, you know, I, I don't personally, mostly because the data I work with are not great for getting at that. So I don't really have much of a, have much of a feel. Um, yeah, um, it is to say most, there are many species of butterflies. We think, I think is the most charismatic ones, like the painted ladies and the tortoise shells and the monarchs move great distances. Um, so we think about like, we can, we can classify them in these traditional like meta population dynamics where things move across a landscape. There are many other species that really don't go anywhere. You know, they live in one spot. Um, and those, especially in the mountains where you, like, you can have mountaintops where things just don't really move. They aren't effective at dispersing compared to like monarchs and painted ladies. Um, so actually a lot of the times there's just, there aren't really as many sources and sinks as there's just, they're all doing their own thing, you know? Um, yeah. Um, and from Evan Mettler, uh, who talks about um, his role as the environmental education coordinator at his institution, uh, what are some local efforts or how can people get involved lo locally to promote or relay to teachers in terms of how schools can get involved in understanding or involving or performing environmental stewardship on this topic? Yeah, um, it's a really great question. It's This is also a fairly new area for me. So um, the I yeah, like I said, I spent most of my time probably isolated in the mountains looking at butterflies. Um, but I think the, uh, well, one, the, the Xerces Society is like, they're, you know, doing amazing work with insect conservation. And I'm sure, I think uh, Emily After Me works for them the next talk. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know they're always doing amazing work. Um, also like local things you can do is one, um, like planting milkweed is great for monarchs but also like not only planting milkweed, like there are other, it's actually pretty bad for most other butterflies, at least at least larval wise. Um, so like a diversity of plants and pr promoting that for, um, might be beneficial for other insects that are out there trying trying to make, you know, trying to make it in the world. Um, yeah, I, don't, I feel like I didn't really answer that question very well, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that's all right. I'm going to throw in another one. If you're interested in this, um, you know, fairly easy way to get involved in citizen science, Journey North has been doing, uh, has an online uh, location where you can submit your observations of uh, migratory, hum migratory hummingbirds, butterflies, um, even some other species too. So um, that's a good place. I think it's simple to use for schools. Uh, and also simple to go on and actually look at the data as well. So, and then I think you mentioned iNaturalist, which is another yeah. good site. That's great. Um, so thanks again, Chris. It was really great to have you. If you can stay on and if there are any other questions at the end, that would sure. be, that would be great. Um, I'm going to, at this time though, turn it over to Emily. Uh, Emily is with the Xerxes Society and she'll be talking about beyond neonics, pesticide risks to pollinators. Thank you for joining us today, Emily. Thanks so much for having me. And Chris, that was a really great presentation and a uh, nice lead into the one that I'm going to be giving. Um, I was feeling like a little bit of an odd bird out being someone from an invertebrate conservation group uh, coming to a hummingbird talk, but um, I feel like this will hopefully be a good follow on to that last presentation. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be with you today. Um, my name is Emily May. 
I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the pesticide program at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. My background is in ecology and entomology. I did a master's in entomology studying wild bees, wildflower habitat, and the impacts of pest management in um, Michigan blueberries. So um, you'll note that I work for an invertebrate conservation group. And so my talk is gonna have a lot of pictures of bees, but I did try and have one of a hummingbird uh, to start out. Uh, our mission at Xerces is really working to conserve all wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. So by working to reduce the risks of pesticides to invertebrate pollinators, we're also benefiting vertebrate pollinators, other wildlife, other flower visitors and animals that are farther up the food chain. As many of those groups have some of the same routes of exposure to pesticide contamination and the action that's needed for their conservation can go hand in hand. I also just wanted to say coming after uh, Chris's talk that it does seem like some of the preliminary data on Western monarchs this year is promising. And I can't really say anything until after the Thanksgiving count is officially in hand, but some of the early counts that are coming in are looking promising for a little bit of a population rebound this year, which is great. Just wanted to put a little positive news in there before I doom and gloom you through a pesticide talk. Um, so uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Xerces Society, uh, we're a nonprofit organization that uh, we're celebrating our 50th year this year. Uh, we focus on the conservation of bees and butterflies and other invertebrates, all of which are, are essential to the natural world as we know it. They provide this vital base to the food chain, um, provide pollination services, decomposition and recycling services, and natural pest control. We're based um, on the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, but I'm actually coming to you from Vermont. We have a lot of regional field staff that are based around the country. So among the many services that invertebrates provide is pollination. And that's where there's a crossover here with hummingbirds. Um, pollination is a critical service for wild plant communities and for human diets. Plant pollinator relationships underlie a lot of different features of our natural ecosystems but pollinators and other wildlife are vulnerable to the effects of pesticides in our world. Um, pesticides are one of the primary drivers of insect declines along with habitat loss, climate change, um, and they've been linked with declines in birds as well. The vast majority of birds consume insects at some point in their lives, and these insects are the base of the food chain. So loss of function in those relationships and networks can mean a cascade of other impacts on wildlife. So in order to be able to protect pollinators and the ecosystems that are depending on them, it's important that we understand complex risks of pesticides and then how we can work towards solutions to reduce reliance on and use of pesticides in our home gardens, in our city parks, roadsides, and on farms. So let's talk about uh, pesticides and, and some of the risks, the big red flags of pesticides for pollinators. So when I say risk, it kind of has a particular meaning, which is it's a function of two things, the toxicity or how harmful a pesticide is to a particular organism, a pollinator, whether that's a hummingbird or a bee or a butterfly, and then exposure. So toxicity and exposure together are what, what create risk. So exposure um, is, is sort of the likelihood that that species of concern or interest is coming into contact with the pesticide and how much of the pesticide it's coming into contact with. So some of the red flags for exposure include widespread use um, or the pesticide might be prone to moving off site easily and, and that's how it's becoming a, a route of exposure for a pollinator. Uh, high persistence chemicals, ones with slow degradation rates, that's also a potential red flag for exposure because they're present in the environment for a long time before breaking down. And then we also want to be thinking about how specific pathways of exposure are intersecting with species of interest. So let's talk about that a little bit more. There are lots of different ways that pollinators in particular could be exposed to pesticide contamination. So a pollinator might be sprayed directly on, you know, they're out flying around and um, they fly into the, the, the place where a pesticide application is happening. This is particularly an issue if plants are being treated when they're flowering. 
Uh, pollinators might also be exposed by visiting flowers that were previously sprayed. Um, so some pesticides, you know, don't break down immediately. So something that's coming and visiting a flower that was previously treated might come into contact with residues, even if the spray happened when bees or other pollinators weren't around. Um, thinking about bees specifically, many of which um, line their nest with mud or leaves or live in soil on, on underground, they may either be collecting nest materials from plants that contain pesticides or have pesticide residues on them. So if, if leaves or the soil you know, underneath where plants have been treated uh, are contaminated, bees could be exposed for a long time in their nests. And then finally, and this is something that I'm going to talk about for a few slides, systemic pesticides work by being absorbed by plants and moving inside plant tissue. So this is where we would have concern for a variety of flower visitors and plant users, you know, including hummingbirds, butterflies, bees, etc. So pollinators that are visiting, visiting plants for pollen or nectar or leaves, leaf material, they could be exposed days, weeks, or even sometimes months after applications of systemic persistent insecticides. So pollinators can be exposed in all of these different pathways. Um, and so when, they're, when the pesticide is persistent and particularly toxic, that means a long period of potential risk for animals that are visiting and feeding on plants. Oh, and I forgot that I put circles around all of these different exposure pathways. <laughs> so this talk is, is titled Beyond Neonics, but I kind of wanted to use them as a starting point. You've already heard um, great presentations that touch on neonics and on the many potential impacts um, that many of which we're really just starting to understand on other wildlife. Um, and we, we talk a lot about neonics at Xerxes because they have this particular combination of characteristics that make them particularly high risk to pollinators. So most neonics are highly toxic to bees, both when they contact them on their bodies or when they, they uh, ingest them and, and feed on them orally. On the exposure side, they also pose real challenges. Um, so they're water soluble systemic insecticides, meaning they're moving into and through plant tissues and they can be expressed in pollen and nectar. They are persistent, sometimes remaining at harmful levels in woody plants and soil for months to years after they were applied. Um, and, and they also are very widespread use. So the figure on the right shows the increase in neonicotinoid use by crop in the US from 1992 to 2014. This data is from US Geological Survey. And this is the really massive increase in the use of these chemicals in a very short period of time. Um, and so it's really no wonder that neonics have dominated the conversation about pesticide risk in the last decade or so, because all of these factors together mean that, that they are particularly high risk. But they are not the only pesticides that pose risks to pollinators. And they're not even close to the only systemic insecticides. So there's a variety of systemic insecticides that could pose um, problems for insects feeding on nectar or pollen or contaminated plant tissues. So when I say systemic, it's sort of a range of um, systemic activity from locally systemic, just moving from you know, one side of the leaf to the other side, or only moving in part of a plant, to very mobile chemicals that are able to move throughout a plant you know, upwards from the site where they're applied. And the main concern with systemics for pollinators is um, when they reach the pollen and nectar, where they might be picked up by flower visitors like bees or hummingbirds, or where they basically are taken up by sucking insects. And then um, their uh, honeydew is actually a really important source of carbohydrates for a lot of um, invertebrates and also vertebrates in, in plant systems. So, that's another source where a sucking insect might take up a neonic and then it gets, uh, or another systemic insecticide and it gets expressed into honeydew. Um, so the other concern is that when a systemic insecticide has been taken up by a plant, um, they're generally more protected from UV breakdown and they're more stable. So that's why they can persist inside woody plants for a longer period of time than they would if they were applied just to the leaves, you know, as a foliar application. 
So other systemics uh, besides neonics are felt, some of, some of them are very old, but some of them are fairly new and they lack that robust independent studies that assess risk. So some of these are, are particularly concerning. And I think you've already heard about butanolides as sort of like the, the coming systemics. Um, but th these two first groups, sulfo sulfoxamines and butanolides are basically the other neonics. Um, try saying any of these words three times fast and I, I uh, <laughs> they're a little challenging, but they're, they're both uh, newish chemistries that are very close cousins of the neonicotinoids. They have similar chemical structures, essentially the same mode of action and the same kind of systemic activity. So it's really kind of a nice marketing trick that pesticide manufacturers were able to convince regulators to categorize these two groups as distinct from neonics because they're among the same um, types of, of chemicals and there's something to look out for in terms of the same exposure pathways for pollinators. These two groups aren't currently as common as some of the other pesticides in use, but they're steadily gaining ground. So there, I have all these groups listed here, um, many of which have risks for bees and invertebrate pollinators specifically. Not all of them pose equal risks to vertebrates like hummingbirds. So avermectins are, um, they, this is a group that includes the now infamous, infamous ivermectin, um, but they are derived from soil bacterium and they have been in common use as antiparasitic treatments for uh, nematodes and lice, et cetera, especially for livestock. But they're binding to invertebrate specific glutamate receptors on nerve cells and muscle cells, meaning that they are toxic to many invertebrates but relatively low toxicity to birds and mammals. So there's something that I would be concerned about directly with bees, uh, but their impacts on hummingbirds and other vertebrates might be more indirect through something like an impact on the food chain. So I just wanted to have this slide in here to broaden horizons and start thinking a little bit about some of the other things that, that uh, beyond neonics that pose risk to pollinators. I also wanted to note that most herbicides are systemic and many fungicides are also systemic. And I will be talking about those in just a second. So where are systemic insecticides used? Judging from a lot of marketing literature and extension publications, the use of, common, of, of systemic insecticides to manage common crop, nursery, and urban pests is on the rise. Systemic insecticides are used against a wide variety of different insects and mites. Um, and they're approved for use on many, many different crops. Um, there are seeds that are treated on, with a, a, an insecticidal coating of systemic insecticides and fungicides that are applied across millions of acres of row crops, like corn and soybean and, and cotton and wheat and that sort of thing. They're also commonly used in nursery production, as well as in our urban spaces on lawns and turf grass for grub control and injected into the trunks of woody plants um, that are grown for landscaping or in nurseries. So the, these are all very common sources of systemic insecticide use around us. I did wanna direct you to and sort of announce, I'm um, excited to announce that we have a new Xerces resource, a new database on systemic insecticides. Amazingly, there is no central list from EPA or elsewhere of what insecticides could be categorized as having systemic activity. So this is the first and only database of systemic insecticides that's available. And you can search this by toxicity, persistence, relative index of systemic activity, and whether it's used on seed treatments. Um, so this is new on the website, um, and I'm happy to share the link to that. So that was, that was a little bit of um, some of the insecticides that come into um, exposure to pollinators through these, these ex exposure pathways in pollen and nectar, as well as honeydew. And while insecticides pose some of the most obvious risk to pollinators, there are other types of pesticides that do also present risk. Fungicides are generally classified as practically non-toxic based on standardized testing that's done when a pesticide is registered. But there's a lot of new research that's finding um, some significant risk from the use of different fungicides. 
So current fungicide use patterns, um, like many insecticides, these are very widespread use um, chemicals, both in agricultural and in urban spaces. There are a wide array of fungicides that have been found in and on wild bees collected from ag landscapes, as well as they're, they're some of the most common and, and abundant types of pesticides that, that are found in bumblebee and honeybee hive materials. So what's the, what's the concern with fungicide? There's research that's finding a number of concerning impacts of fungicides. So there, there have been studies that have found symptoms that resemble malnutrition after exposure to certain fungicides, like reduced brood rearing um, in honeybees, queen loss, and increased pathogen levels. Bees that are exposed to fungicides are more vulnerable to certain pathogens. Uh, this is of particular concern for certain declining bumblebee species. There was a study that came out that found that certain fungicide use was the strongest predictor of pathogen prevalence and range contractions in a few declining species of bumblebees. Um, and they can also synergize the toxicity of certain insecticides when they uh, are applied together, like in a tank mix. So, or when, you know, as Chris's presentation showed, there are times when um, it's, it would be common for a bee or a butterfly to experience really complex mixtures of insecticides and fungicides on a regular basis in, in a variety of different landscapes. And this is something that we don't know a huge amount about, but there's, there's definitely reason for concern here, given just how widespread the use of fungicides and insecticides are across millions of acres of cropland and urban land. So this is, this is what I'm hoping you're taking away from all of the presentations today, is some of this sheer complexity of interactions that are affecting wildlife communities. This is a figure from our fact sheet on fungicide impacts which you can find on our website if you want to dive deeper. But essentially, it's showing that there's a lot of different things that are impacting bee health and fitness. And I think this, the same stressors are likely to be true for other wildlife, including hummingbirds. So bees foraging in agricultural and urban landscapes, again, exposed to complex mixtures of pesticides. Some of these pesticides may interact with each other to affect how toxic they are when a pollinator is exposed to them. Um, exposure to insecticides and fungicides can also compromise the health and immune function of these pollinators, making them more susceptible to pathogens, parasites, and diseases. And something that's underlying a lot of these interactions is nutrition. How much flowering habitat are these animals able to access and how high quality is the forage available for them? Poor nutrition from a lack of diversity of forage or a lack of access to habitat um, that leads them to have to travel farther to find food and shelter um, and spend more energy collecting it can also contribute to poor immune function, make them more susceptible to pathogens, et cetera. And then there are these you know, bigger scale drivers like climate um, and habitat loss and degradation that contribute at a lot of different scales to nutrition in pollinator and plant communities. So pesticides are interacting with a lot of these other environmental stressors to affect our pollinators and our natural ecosystems. So finally, on the, on the risk side, I wanted to talk about herbicides for a couple of slides. Herbicide-based weed management is extremely widespread, used across millions of acres of uh, cropland to manage uh, weeds. Herbicide-resistant crops came around in the 90s and really changed the face of row crop agriculture. And they've been adopted nearly universally across millions of acres of row cropland. Herbicides are also commonly used in restoration work and in cities and parks and rangelands and elsewhere for invasive plant management. So what are the potential impacts on pollinators from herbicides? I think the biggest impact is indirect in the sense that they're relatively low toxicity on contact to bees, but they kill broadleaf plants that provide food and shelter for pollinators across millions of acres of cropland. So this is both in the areas directly treated by herbicides like this orchard bare ground understory, uh, but it's also in millions more acres downwind of crop fields. So in the last few years, as glyphosate resistance has increased in crop weeds, um, 
companies have turned to older herbicides that are really susceptible to uh, moving downwind as drift. Um, so 2,4-D and dicamba are common replacement chemicals for um, farms that have, you know, have a lot of glyphosate resistance in their weeds. And so they are extremely prone to drift and sometimes can move half a mile or more uh, away from the site where they've been applied and then deposit out from the atmosphere and affect wild plant communities. So the photo on the right is a redbud tree that's suffering from that kind of herbicide drift from dicamba or 2,4-D. And that kind of drift, which is really common and um, has been reported across millions of acres in the last five years, can reduce flowering and nectar production and survival of wild plants that are, uh, that are continuously exposed to these kind of drift events. So this is a definitely a concern and something that we're working more on um, is, is trying to understand the real impacts of herbicides and herbicide drift on wild plant and pollinator communities. But coming back to some of the direct impacts, you know, these herbicides are used for invasive plant management as well. And there is this window for exposure to herbicides and nectar when they're applied to flowering plants, but before plants kind of react to the herbicides and dry out and die. So that might be a window of hours, or it might be a couple of days. And when herbicides are ingested in nectar, they may have more impacts than when something just comes into contact with dried residues. So glyphosate is the most widely used herbicide, therefore also the most widely studied for impacts. And we know from some studies on honeybees that glyphosate can affect the gut microbiome in bees. So when bees consume glyphosate, it basically can strip out some of the biofilm that lines their guts, which is made up of bacteria, and it can change the bacterial composition of their guts which can make them more, inf uh, more vulnerable to infection by pathogens, especially gut pathogens. So this is just one herbicide, one impact of an herbicide. We know so very little about the impacts of other herbicides on pollinators. Many of these herbicides are also systemic, may end up in the nectar of a plant in that kind of window of exposure after application before the plant dies. So one key mitigation for invasive plant management and also for herbicide use in agriculture is to avoid herbicide uh, applying sí, herbicides. Would you mind eh, muting your, uh, if, if you still have your, um, okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> one, yeah, one mitigation here is avoid applying herbicides to plants in bloom. Um, the photo here is from the New York Department of Environmental Conservation, which is showing a person cutting the umbel off of giant hogweed before the plant is treated with an herbicide, which helps to reduce exposure to the herbicide for pollinators, but it also has the you know, dual purpose um, impact of being more effective at, at managing this plant overall for, because it helps reduce seed production. So that was a very small example of risk reduction for pollinators in um, just helping reduce exposure to an herbicide at application, but we do need larger scale change. So how can we reduce reliance on and use of pesticides to help reduce their impacts on wildlife? Um, part of the solution is all around us. As your attendance at this webinar testifies, interest in pollinators has really exploded and uh, also in pesticides. So there's huge interest in pollinator gardening uh, that has become really evident in the last few years and people are organizing to help support pollinators. So this slide is just highlighting a few pollinator centered efforts that have inspired a lot of people to work on um, improving habitat and reducing pesticide use in urban spaces. So bee cities, bee campuses, the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge, Monarch Way Stations, as well as the efforts by dozens of cities to reduce pesticide use and impact through pesticide reduction pledges. Lots of things happening at the, the local and town and community scale. And how might we think specifically about pesticides in these types of efforts? So especially in yards and gardens, we would really like to see elimination of pesticide use that's in response to cosmetic concerns rather than the health of a plant or the loss of a crop. Because in many cases, these types of cosmetic issues can be avoided in the first place by just planting the right plant in the right place and by providing 
diverse habitat for beneficial insects that helps prevent pest outbreaks. Um, it also involves getting people to change behaviors and giving practical tips to help solve pest problems using preventive strategies, not considering pesticides as this first line of defense, which is a whole mindset change for a lot of folks. So it involves a lot of outreach and education to, to, to try and get folks to manage pests using preventive strategies. And one set of principles that can help in a variety of different settings and scales is prevention based integrated pest management. So this is something that we're trying to encourage adoption of by homeowners and also by you know, city park staff and, and municipalities to think about in a really pollinator friendly prevention based integrated pest management framework for managing pests. There's also you know, concerns about pesticide exposure through nursery plants. So people trying to do the right thing, put in a pollinator garden, but those plants might be contaminated with pesticides that were applied during their production in nurseries. So one of the steps that we are wanting people to take is to ask nurseries for plants that are free of pesticides that could harm pollinators. And so we now have some resources to help with this because this is something that people have asked us for for a long time. So the first one on the left there, buying bee safe plants is meant for you, the consumer, which is to discuss and provide examples of pollinator friendly nursing nursery practices. And then the second one offering bee safe plants is meant to be sort of left with nurseries when you visit as a consumer so that they can compare practices, pollinator friendly press pest management practices against what they're using in their nursery. And both of these resources are available on our website. And I'm wrapping up here. I was trying to think of how I might change this slide to better reflect this talk and audience, but bird and influencer didn't really have the same ring to it. So I'm hoping that you will still be happy to be an influencer. <laughs> Um, and this, this is really to say that as a consumer, you have a lot of power, especially when banded together with others. A little bit of pressure can go a long way in a lot of different contexts. You have power in your word of mouth and when you talk to friends, when you talk to your social networks and on your social media. So I'm, I'm hoping that as we work together across different organisms, across bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, we can work to be transforming practices and making the world a little bit safer for pollinators. And I just last minute threw this slide in um, after Chris's presentation to say there are a lot of ways that um, local schools or you as an individual could get involved in some of the efforts that are going on to monitor bees and butterflies. So the bumblebee watch is a great place to get involved if you're interested in taking out a smartphone and, and sharing bumblebee observations. Uh, Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper is another community science effort um, that, that's led by Xerces and that is um, just mapping monarchs and milkweed observations across the West. Um, it's a really great source of information for us and researchers to use to sort of figure out where pollinator populations um, are surviving, thriving, and, and maybe not doing so well. So every contribution to these types of community science efforts is really helpful. So you can look into that and get involved on our website. So thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to talk about this. And I just wanted to say that we're a member supported nonprofit and um, many thanks to our members for allowing me to give talks like this. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, really good to have you on and to share that information. So thank you very much. Uh, there were a number of questions coming through. Uh, some of them are still on milkweed. Thanks for the hummingbird photos we have. Um, Greg says, support small nurseries that specialize in native plants. Uh, Wendy is doing a project of gardens for hummingbirds and butterflies in Colombia. Um, well, they're looking for funding sources. So if anybody has idea for funding sources for pollinator gardens in Colombia, if you can, you could speak up. Um, any specific questions for Emily though? I'll leave that for just a moment. What I'd like to do maybe is go back to a few of our previous questions that we didn't get answered. 
so I had some questions from, well, we have a recurring question. Maybe what I'll do is, let's see, bring up Stacy and Chris. Um, let me bring you guys on. And have you come on and answer questions as well. Let's see, I think I can pin you as well. No, I don't want to do that. I want to spotlight all of you. Ah, there we go. Add a spotlight, add a spotlight, and Christine. Christine, there you are. I will spotlight you. And I think Lisa Tell had to jump off, so we lost her. Uh, but a couple of questions we had, I think there's an kind of a running thread about um, milkweed in Mexico. And I was wondering if anybody could answer the question about planting milkweed is recommended for the US and Canada, but not for Latin America. I don't know if everybody is um, checking the, ch the chat box here. Um, I'm also gonna bring on Greg Butcher. So thanks to Greg for joining. Greg is with US Forest Service International Programs. And Greg, let me spotlight you so you can pitch in. We missed Greg at the first, but he's gonna join us now. Uh, so does anyone wanna to speak to the milkweed topic in Mexico? I'll just let whoever thinks so, they wanna take that well, on. I put a couple of things in the chat and um, the concern is the farther south you go, the more likely tropical milkweed is to um, uh, bloom year round. And uh, there are places in the Southern US and in Mexico where you've got tropical milkweed uh, blooming year round and the monarchs uh, butterflies come and stay year round. And if they stay put and breed year round, they build up um, parasites and those parasites can um, depress uh, the, the monarch butterfly population. So planting milkweed in the early spring in Northeast Mexico is really helpful. Uh, for the eastern population to spread north after a, a long winter, uh, but to have uh, milkweeds that are breeding in the fall and winter uh, can be harmful to, to those, uh, those same monarchs when they come back in the fall. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Greg. Any, any other thoughts on that topic? Okay, um, I know I know not everybody might be checking, everybody might not be checking the chat box. Uh, Emily just posted a link to her database. Uh, I just a put in a, a, a link to the systemic insecticides list and database oh, okay. and also um, a, a link to the California pollinator plants list that we have. It's not a specific landscape design, which I think um, someone in the chat was looking for, but it does it's a starting point for looking for pollinator plants. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Emily. And then here's a question from Evan. This may be a far reaching question because it is bylaw dependent, but are there alternatives for lot, lawn types such as clover or wild grass that could be implemented to avoid heavy pesticide use or pesticide or water use? So that's a that's a great question, and I think it is going to also depend on where you're located and how um, you know what the local conditions are for for your rainfall. Um, but yes, there are alternatives for lawn types. You can you know you can include clover. You can include some other um, sort of low lying flowering plants. Um, but I think it ends up coming down to um, if you have a homeowners association that is managing your lawn, um, changing the pesticide um, use policies at that homeowners association or, or with the land care company that's working with you. Um, in my case, I actually just removed lawn and put in a pollinator meadow, which is very lazy and low maintenance in the long term. <laughs> Ooh, that sounds great. <laughs> sounds really great. Um, let me see if I have any other questions here. I think we, I think we don't. I think we got to all of them. Um, well, there was, well, there were some earlier ones here. Here's an interesting question from Deanne. Not sure if this is applicable to your area. Are the adverse effects of pesticide use by illegal marijuana grow sites in national forests included in studies, uh, such as Los Padres National Forest has quite large illegal marijuana growing mostly run by cartels and per local law enforcement agencies and military helicopter pilots, they make liberal use of very toxic pesticides and other chemicals. 
I did not know that. That's interesting. They also put out a lot of rodenticides and kill a lot of mammals and uh, birds using rodenticides. But I also think that it's so there has been actually some a, a little bit of research on it, at least from the rodenticide point of view. Um, but I also um, think that it's really important to, for people to think that you know those 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 issues exist, but the broader issue of you know pesticide using use in every corner of your world, um, you know, from the plants you bring home in your that are in your garden through to the food that you eat is a far, far bigger problem, um, you know, in terms of challenging uh, what's going on with ecosystems. Any other comments on that topic? Thanks, Christine. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is Stacy. Um, I'm not entirely clear on what the question is, um, but yes, we're definitely aware of it. Um, you know, it's hard because <clears throat> the places get so contaminated that it's actually really dangerous for our law enforcement division to even really go in there, anyone to really go in there and get rid of those plants um, just because what the herbicides they're using and pesticides they're using are so toxic. Um, <clears throat> and several people have gotten really ill from that. Um, and so it's kind of considered like a, um, you know, a really dangerous contamination area. And we are just trying to figure out ways to go about cleaning those up in a safe manner. Um, we do have several groundwater monitoring studies that are tracking um, pesticide residues in the groundwater on several of our forests. Um, but, uh, and we do have a proposal right now to see if, um, any of those illegal herbicides um, are showing up in the soil and in the water and how far away from water sources. And so um, it's just a really difficult thing to deal with because you know you can go through all that to clean up one area just for another one to pop up. You know, there's a lot of wilderness area out there and we just don't have the staff to be, you know, patrolling everywhere all the time. And so um, it is a really big issue, um, that's for sure. But um, I mean, we're, tra we're tracking it and trying to take care of it as much as we can. Thank you. Um, let's see, a couple other comments in the chat box. Uh, Blake says, thanks for differentiating the toxicity to pollinators between the different categories of pesticides. It seems that a lot of General caution about pesticides may not be reflective of the nuances depending on the type of pesticide, toxicity, timing rate, and method of application. Not a question, but just a comment. And uh, Christine, thanks for the comment in Canada. They're helping to solve the grow problem by making marijuana legal throughout the country. Does that, I mean, it's legal in a lot of places here where it's grown illegally. So um, I'm not sure if it takes care of the problem here in the United States. It has resolved a lot of grow up issues in Canada. Um, I'm not sure if it's because it's a national thing, but I used to run into a lot of grow up problems in different areas I worked in and I'm not seeing that anymore. Um, and uh, there used to be um, a big part of Eastern British Columbia was a grow up. <laughs> and now it's, um, it's, out in the open and a lot more easily regulated. Right. Well, not any more questions. I just wanna thank the panelists so much for joining us. This has been hugely informative and we really appreciate it. Um, Greg, I wanted to see if you wanted to have a few last words before we- yeah, I just off. wanted to thank people for tuning in and to uh, let everyone know that uh, those of you that are interested in hummingbird conservation, that we will be doing a comprehensive conservation plan for Western hummingbirds. And uh, we invite people that are interested to get in touch with us uh, to participate. So um, you can get onto Western uh, Hummingbird Partnership website. I think there's contact information there. And there's Sue Bonfield's uh, email. Uh, so anyone interested in helping us with conservation planning for uh, Western hummingbirds should get in touch with us. And we'll be doing a lot of, of focus on threats 
And as, as the uh, speakers highlighted today, there's just this multitude of threats that interact with each other. And so um, we want to think, uh, look at those as a group and um, try to see what we can do to uh, stabilize some of bird populations, which uh, uh, Christine's study has shown have had a really bad uh, past 10 years. Some species have had a really bad past 50 years. So we're trying to do what we can as a partnership to uh, improve populations of Western hummingbirds and other pollinators that uh, they interact with. So again, thanks for attending and thanks to the speakers. I think I, I certainly learned a ton, so I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, I just also wanted to say thanks so much because I learned so much. Uh, and I think it's just great that um, there is this effort to make a crossover between <laughs> birds and other, you know, invertebrate, invertebrate pollinators. Uh, and um, maybe next time include some bats. But thanks so much. Thank you. And yes, this is recorded. Uh, please look on the westernhummingbird.org website for the recording, and it'll also be on YouTube. If you get our newsletter, we'll announce it there as well. Thank you so much, everyone.